Good morning, church. Let's stand together. Good to see you today. Worship the Lord together we sing, all creatures. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him. Church, all the redeemed.
give him praise this morning, church. The Lord is worthy of our praise today. Well, welcome to Capstone Church. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we're glad you are here. We invite you to sing along and study the scriptures with us, hopefully as we help one another follow Jesus better today. He's invited us, all creatures, to worship him and have fellowship with him this morning. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 90 as we begin, church. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever formed, you formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream or a grass that is renewed in the morning. It flourishes and is renewed in the evening. It fades and it withers. And you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. So teach us, Lord, to number our days. that We may get a heart of wisdom. And satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. And let the favor of the Lord, our God, be upon us today. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You can be seated, church. Amen. Good morning, church. Good to see you guys. Uh, Britt, Jenny, y'all ready to, ready to do this? This is... Macy, Britton, Payne, Jenny, Britt, Miss Mary Mac. They're matching, okay? <laughs> and uh, Britt and Jenny, I, I was, I mean, I, I, we've known each other a long time. I, I, Britt used to play drums for us when I was at Circlewood, and this beautiful, sweet little girl used to come by and see him as well. Uh, and how, how the Lord is, has been faithful to you guys, man. I praise the Lord for that and how he's provided these two beautiful baby girls here. And today we, we celebrate Macy and, uh, and we, we ask the Lord to, to, to take her and to, to use her uh, for his glory. We, we read Psalm 78, y'all know this, uh, just to remind ourselves what it is that God's called us to as parents. It says, what we have heard and know, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from our children. We will tell them the, the next generation, the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord is power and the wonders he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed the law in Israel, which he commanded the fathers to teach their children, so the next generation would know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then, again, this is our hope, right? Then they, our children, would put their hope in God and would not forget his works, but keep his commandments. So, Britt and Jenny, we, we ask each other these, these, these two slides of questions when it comes to, to raising these, uh, these sweet girls. It's also a really big day for the pains because we're doing baby dedication for... For, for Macy Britton, and then just a minute, we're going to baptize Miss Mary Mack, okay? Uh, so, uh, and, and I was just thinking about that, and like, we prayed for that, right? And, and the Lord is faithful to, to answer those prayers. Britton, Jenny, will you commit to trust God's promises made to you and your children in His Word? Will you commit to seek God and seek gospel change in the way you love and parent your children? Will you commit to discipline your children and show them grace? Will you commit to teach uh, God's Word to them and live out the gospel in your home? <clears throat> will you Commit to pray for them and teach them to pray. And when you commit to partner with this church community, seek their help and accountability and lead your children to do the same. If you'll just respond with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. You liking these lights? <laughs> <laughs> church, again, this is something we do together, right? We talk about this. This is, this is something that we do as we, as we together are trying to raise our kids in the, in the ways of God. Would you uh, hear, hear this, these questions for you, and I want you to respond, okay? Uh, well, church, will you commit to seek... God and seek gospel change in the way you live before these children? Will you commit to pray for these children that they will grow to love Jesus and trust him? Will you commit to teach them the gospel through both your words and your example? Will you commit to partner with these parents, holding them accountable and confronting their sin? Will you commit to <clears throat> pray for them and encourage them as they face the trials of parenting? Would you stand with us, church, and just make this declaration back to them? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Say this to this family. With joy and thanksgiving, as Christ Church, with God's help, we promise to love, encourage, and support you as you follow Christ and train your children in the faith. Let's pray for them. God, I thank you so much for Britt and Jenny, for Miss Mary Mack, uh, God, for Miss Macy Britton, God, here. I, I, I pray 
for her the same thing that, uh, that we prayed for her big sister, God, that at a really young age, because her mom and dad are faithful to plant gospel seeds in her heart, um, God, your spirit would, would, would show her her need for Jesus and that she would trust Jesus at a really young age, God. Um, thank you for the, the gift of these, these two girls. God, thank you for the blessing that you have given to Britt and Jenny. I, I pray for Jenny, God, that she could, um, being a mommy's the greatest job in the world and one of the most difficult things she'll ever do. And so, Lord, would you give her all the grace that she needs and the patience and the rest. Um, God, for Britt, Lord, what a, what a joy and what an opportunity he has to, to raise these two girls. <clears throat> God, help him to love Jenny well and to show them what a, what a godly husband looks like, that they don't ever have to wonder what a godly man looks like, that they would see one every single day in their daddy. Uh, and God, ultimately, we just ask you to take Macy here, and you, you, you do uh, whatever pleases you with her, God, that you would use her for your great glory, uh, God, to, to, to bring glory to your name and good to this world. Thank you again for the, this family, and I pray you would bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen church, we continue worshiping together.
In Psalm 86, David prays, Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and I am needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call on you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on your name. So hear my prayer, Lord, and listen to my cry for mercy. We too, church, are poor and needy this morning. So let's call on the name of the Lord together as we confess our sin today. He is forgiving. He is good. He is abounding in love to all who call on his name. So let's pray silently. Cast our cares on him today, on our loving Father. Let's call on his name this morning. i 
us with assurance this morning, church. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. can be seated as we celebrate baptism together. No, you're good. Thank you. Um, this is Mary Mac, okay? Uh, if you if your kids want to stand in their chairs and watch baptism, they're welcome to stand up, okay? It's, it's good. Uh, Miss Mary Mac, your dad has got a few things he wants to say to you, okay? He thinks. <laughs> Yeah, I've uh, practiced this numerous times, but I know it's going to be much harder uh, here today, uh, especially with the worship, great worship today and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So, Mary Mac, Jeremiah 1.5 tells us that before you were formed in the womb, God already knew you. He set you apart before you were even born. We are so proud of your decision to trust him and are so excited to celebrate your faith in him today. We pray you will always remember whose you are. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. We're proud, right? You are now not only our precious baby girl, but also our sweet sister in Christ. As you grow, we pray you will continue to let your light shine bright so that the choices you make and the words you use will bring glory to your Father in heaven. We love you more than you'll ever know. Love, Mom and Dad. trusted Jesus and asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Awesome. Well, it's upon that profession of faith that your dad is greatest joy in his life here to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Let's stand together, church, and greet one another as forgiven brothers and sisters this morning. Pass the peace to one another. Kids, you're dismissed at this time as well. Your leaders are back there at the doors. Please remain standing for our Old Testament reading. church. I don't know how they expect me to read out loud after that. I mean, what a, a sweet and beautiful picture of obedience. Our Old Testament reading for this month is Psalm 100, which is a psalm of giving thanks. So we'll read it together. I'll read the small text, read the underlying text together, 
So let's continue to worship the Lord this morning by reading together. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're so thankful that your words are true, and that your love endures forever. That your love for us is not based on our faithfulness to you, but your faithfulness to us. Lord, we're so thankful that you loved us first. Thankful that you love us still. And that you'll love us forever. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come in, into your house today, into your church, to worship you. I pray that as we delve into your word, Lord, that you speak to us. Uh, have us to see and to hear what you would have from us. Thank you again, Lord, for how you love us. Thank you most of all for Jesus. It's in his wonderful name. Amen. All right. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Josh. Um, good morning. Uh, hey, I just... Um, we, we had a medical issue in the first service, uh, so um, a, a, a young lady by the name of Josie uh, passed out, and uh, anyway, um, be praying for her. Uh, Brad, Bradley just has been at the hospital seeing her, and uh, she's doing well, but just be praying for Josie, and, uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, be, be good. And David Eichard uh, stayed for two services to, to hear the sermon, so he gets Church Member of the Week Award, okay? So, uh, <laughs> hey, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can... You can turn to a lot of places, uh, but you might want to go to Romans 8, okay? Uh, we, this, is, uh, this is one of these weeks uh, that we don't get a lot of here because we generally are walking verse by verse through books of the Bible, but um, we decided to combine a few weeks there toward the end of Acts and uh, ended up having this one week uh, where we were in between Acts and Advent, and so you get what we call a single serve, uh, just this one sermon uh, that we can talk through some things, and, and I really thought it would be helpful for us to just take a few minutes and talk about our identity in Christ. Okay, what, what does that mean? Uh, why would we talk about that? Why should we do that? Here's, here's why, okay? Um, because you and I are being identified by various things, right, uh, in, our, in our lives. You you identify yourself in certain ways. Others identify you in, the, in, in different ways, right? You have, um, you have identity politics that drive people's thoughts. You have, um, you're identified by what zip code you live in. You're identified by all sorts of things. And, and, and some of those things are good and some of those things maybe aren't so good. We also, many of us can have things from our past that we wear like a scarlet letter in our lives, right? We have, we have mistakes that we've made, sins we've committed. Maybe it's not even that. Maybe for you, somebody has said something about you that scarred you, and here you are 20 years later, and you still identify yourself in that regard. And I, I, I mean, I talk to, I talk to people, I, I remember having a conversation not that long ago with a, a man older than me that was so scarred by something that happened when he was in high school that it still def he still allowed it to define him. Because we all are finding our identity in everything. Right? We, 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 will, we, we tie our identity to so many things, and it's really dangerous. Um, what I want us to do today is to go, hey, look, let's take all those off. Okay, Let's take all those scarlet letters off, whatever you identify with, whatever party or group you find yourself most connected to. What if we were to take all of those things off and remind ourselves the basic thing we are is, is who we are in Christ, right? That, that defines us. Jesus defines us as, as his people. We've been talking about this as, as the church, as the people of God. The, the most foundational thing that defines us is Jesus. And since it is, I wanted to ask, like, what does that mean? 
And then what should we do because of that? What does it mean to find our identity in Christ? And what does it mean that we should do because of our identity in Christ? You have 11 points, I think, on your paper today, okay? Uh, if you'd like to fill in the blanks, you can grab this card. And we'll walk through these things together, okay? These are really big ideas that I don't have a lot of time to spend on any of them, but I think they're all really important. And my goal for you is you would take this, and maybe this week you could spend some time in these scriptures thinking about these things. Or if you want to play Bible drill, you can get ready because we're going to go fast through some uh, passages of the Bible today. Uh, but who are we in Christ? What does that mean, and what should we do because of it? Five things. You're, you're more than these five things, but five things about how the Bible describes who we are as followers of Jesus. Number one, the Bible says we are justified, meaning that we are forgiven sinners. In Christ, I am justified. I am a forgiven sinner. Um, the word justification is a legal term that means that God, the righteous judge, that we're, every one of us are going to stand before God one day. Okay, Every one of us are going to stand before the righteous judge one day. Everything is naked and laid bare to, whom, to him to whom we must give an account. We're going to stand before God one day as a righteous judge. And those who are in Christ Jesus, he's going to say innocent or justified. We've been justified even though we're sinners. We've been, God has declared that we're innocent even though we are guilty. Right? Even though we're guilty of all these sins. Even though we're guilty in all these ways, God has declared, he's decided in Jesus Christ, that he does not see our sins. Instead, he sees Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. If you're new around here, I'll give you a hint. Romans 8 is my favorite chapter in the Bible, okay? But hear this beautiful word here. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I heard Pastor Ray Ortland say this. He said, Not less condemnation, no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done, not what you've done, what God has done. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. And what did he do? By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God has forgiven us of our sins. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be shut and the whole world held accountable. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Okay? And I always tell you this when we get to this verse. What this verse is saying is, if you think that when you stand before God one day, and I know there's a lot of people that think this way, but if you think that when you stand before God one day, God is going to judge you based on your good deeds versus your bad deeds. And as long as your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, God's going to let you into heaven. What this verse says is, if that's how you think, the Bible tells you to shut your mouth. Right? It says, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be shut and the whole world held accountable. For by works of the law, by doing good or righteous deeds... No human being will be justified, will be declared innocent in God's sight because through the law comes knowledge of sin. That, yet that's not going to work out for you. The Bible actually says it's not going to work out for you. What you should do is the next thing, okay? He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. It's been, been put on display to us. It's been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. This righteousness of God is how, okay? It's been by faith through Jesus, in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, by faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified. We're declared to be innocent, even though we're guilty, we're justified. How? By his grace, as a gift, not by what we do, but by what Jesus has done, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith in Christ. Number one, I am justified. I'm a forgiven sinner. Number two, in Christ, I am adopted. I'm the adopted child of God. I've been adopted into God's family. Britt read these verses earlier. Uh, he read these verses earlier. First John, chapter one, sorry, John 1, 9 to 13. This is the true light that gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people 
didn't receive him, but to all who did receive him, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. 1 John chapter 3, what Britt read earlier. See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. This is how much God loves you, he's saying. How, 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 the kind of love the Father has lavished upon you, that he doesn't call you servants. He doesn't call you just friends. He calls you sons and daughters. You're the, you're the children of God. You've been adopted into God's family. That's in Jesus Christ, that's who you are. And this is my yearly reminder, at least yearly. I try to do it as many times as possible. Um, when you get to heaven, you're not going to become an angel. You know why? Because angels are servants. You're a son. You're not going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp, pouring out the rain, even though the country music songs would make you think that you are. You're going to be at the table with your father, feasting, with a robe and a crown, right? You're not an angel. You're a son. You're a daughter. This is the kind of, here's the kind of love that God has shown you, that you're the children of God. We've been justified. We've been Declared to be innocent even though we're guilty. Number two, we've been adopted into God's family as his children. Number three, we are secure in God's hands. Right? I'm justified. I'm a forgiven sinner. I'm an adopted son. Three, I'm secure in God's hands. God is, God is keeping me. He's the one doing it. I'm not the one doing it. John chapter 10, some of my favorite verses in the Bible. Jesus says this. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. In Jesus, what, how, how does this affect my identity in Christ? Here's how it affects my identity in Christ. Because God is going to keep me his. I'm not going to lose my salvation. Not because of me. Look, if I could lose my salvation, I would. Absolutely. I don't lose my salvation not because of my faithfulness, but because of God's goodness, whose hand I am in. We kind of say it around here this way. A lot of times we, we think about salvation as if I have reached up and grabbed hold of God. But that's not how the Bible speaks about salvation. Us, us trusting in Christ is not me reaching up and grabbing hold of God. Instead, the way the Bible speaks of it is, it's as if it is, not as if he has. God has reached down and grabbed hold of us. That, that, that's the picture. That's what Jesus says. I give them eternal life. They know me. They follow me. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. The, my Father is greater than everyone. And no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. We are secure, not because of us but because of whose hand we are in. We are in God's hand, and because of that, we are secure. Romans chapter 8, again. This is the big crescendo of really the whole book of Romans. He's been building to this point, the first eight chapters, and he says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, and, and really Paul's been arguing for the last eight chapters that God is for us. Everything he's been writing about from Romans 1 all the way to this point is, is him Laying out this defense of the fact that God loves us and God is for us. He's shown us that in Jesus Christ. He gets here. He says, what should we say about this? If God is for us, who could be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also in Christ Jesus graciously give us all things? Who's there to bring a charge against God's elect? No one, right? It's God who, it's God who justifies. Who's there to condemn? No one. Christ Jesus is the one that died. More than that, was raised who's at the right hand of God, who's indeed praying for you and for me. So if that's true, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? He asks, as it is written, for your sakes we were being killed all the day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And then here's the answer, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors because of him who loves us. We're not it has nothing, us being more than conquerors has really nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Jesus. 
We are more than conquerors because through Jesus who loves us. And in this great ending, Paul says, For I am sure of this, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nothing present, this is a good promise, nor things to come, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing in your past that will do that. There's nothing in your present that will do that. There's nothing that's going to come. I don't know, it doesn't matter if today is the last day you live on this earth and you, or you have 90 more years. In Jesus Christ, there is nothing, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That should cause you to breathe, okay? <laughs> like, okay. It doesn't matter. Any of these other things, any of these other things that we identify with, if it doesn't go our way or doesn't go the way we wanted it to go, none of that matters eternally because of whose you are, because you are kept secure in God's hand. Number four, so I'm justified, a forgiven sinner, I'm adopted, a child of God. Three, I'm secure in God's hand. Four, I am free because of this. I am a liberated slave. From sin. When we, when we think about sin, a lot of us don't think of our sin as being enslaved to it, but that's exactly how the Bible speaks about our sin. We're not simply just sinning because we, we sin. We, we sin because we're, we're, we're enslaved to it. Right? And look, I, I love old hymns, okay? I love old hymns. But you were not simply seek, sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore if you've been around church very long. You were dead on the bottom of the ocean of sin, and Jesus drug your lifeless body into the boat and breathed life into your dead lungs. That's how you should see your sin. Your sin, okay, is not a small problem. My sin is not a small problem. You know, and, and, and the thing about sin, I like to I try to remind you of this. Sometimes when we think about sin, we think about our environment. Like if I could, if I could just control my environment more than I can control my sin. Or we think, we parents think this about our children. We think, if I could just make sure I protect my kids from these things or these things, then they're not going to do these things. And while some of that might be true, the biggest problem with your children is inside of them, not outside of them. Okay? The biggest problem with you is inside of you, not outside of you. Because the sin in your heart is deeper than you think, okay? It's deeper than you realize. Actually, the Bible says uh, that outside of Jesus, we're enslaved to it. We're slaves to that sin. Yet in Christ, we are free. We're liberated from the bondage of sin. Romans chapter 6. Paul says, what then should, are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you're slaves to the one whom you obey. Either to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Whatever you submit yourself to, you're slave to that. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who once were slaves of sin have become obedient of the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. I'm speaking, he says, in human terms because of your natural limitations. Thanks, Paul. I think he just dunked on them. Um, For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin... You were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit are you getting, or were you getting at the time from the things for which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, right? But now you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The fruit that you get leads to the sanctification in its end, eternal life. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right? And finally, five. So I'm, I'm, I'm justified, I'm adopted, I'm secure, I'm free. And number five is I'm unfinished. Okay? God is continuing to renew me. You probably, some of you probably sang the same song I sang growing up. 
He's Still Working on Me. Anybody know that song? I hope so. Um, he's Still Working on Me to Make Me What I Ought to Be. It took him just a week, and we can argue over this. I know some of you might argue over this. Um, it took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, Jupiter and Mars. That last line of that song, though, he sang as a kid was this, how loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. Man, I'm, I, I believe that I am following Jesus better at 41 than I was at 31. Uh, today, I, I, I find Jesus sweeter than I did five years ago, ten years ago. My prayer is that continues to happen, right? That, that he continues to work on me. Um, I had somebody, this was a compliment, okay? I took it as a compliment. But um, I had someone tell me uh, earlier this year, they were like, hey, your preaching is getting a lot better. <laughs> was it bad <laughs> uh, before? Um, and I said, look, good, I hope it is. I mean, I hope it's not getting worse. Um, I hope that the more I do anything, I get better at it, right? <laughs> and you as well. But not just the preacher. I hope the, the longer I follow Jesus, um, that I will, he will continue to make me in his image. He'll continue to make you in his image. Psalm 1 talks about this, right? Blessed is the man who uh, finds his delight in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. This man who's planted by the stream, who yields its fruit in its season. Right? This is who we are, that God is working in us. He's doing a work in us. We are not finished. You have not arrived. Okay? Listen, 22-year-old, you have not arrived. It's okay. I, I know you expect to have everything figured out at 22. You don't, and that's okay. You may not even know what you want to do with your life. That's okay as well, okay? Don't, don't tell your parents I told you that, but it's okay. It's okay. You have your whole life still to live. Don't, it, it's okay that you don't know everything. It's okay that you haven't figured everything out. You can trust that this God who is working you is going to continue to work in you. You're unfinished. You're being renewed in Christ. Look what he says in Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. How are we transformed? By the renewal of our minds. God is renewing our minds. That by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That God is renewing our minds. He's taking off old and putting on new. I heard a, a pastor say this one time. I thought it was a really good mental image, particularly for ladies or guys that have sisters and they painted your fingernails maybe when you were a kid. Um, he talked about this verse and this renewal of the mind that like you have to take the old fingernail polish off before you put the new on. Otherwise, it's going to look jacked up. That, that's kind of what the Lord is doing in us, that he's asking us to take off these old things, to put to death that which is sinful in us and to put on these new things that God would renew our minds in the scriptures, that we would follow Jesus and pursue purity and walk in the spirit, all these things. We, we take off the old and we trust the spirit to do a work in us to put on the new. And then Philippians 1.6, which I can't wait to get. We're going to be in Philippians starting in January for a few months. One of my favorite verses in that book is this one. It says, Paul says, for I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. God is the God who began this good work in you. He will, he will complete it. When will he complete it? Not at 41. Okay? He will complete it in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I'm in heaven, when I go to be with Jesus, the Lord will complete. His, he, he, that's when he will have completed the work in me. That's when he will have completed the work in you. And so here, can I just, just remind you of this? Give yourself a little grace, okay? Like, give yourself some grace that you don't have it all figured out. Give yourself some grace that you still screw up sometimes. I'm not saying act like, I'm not saying don't call something that's sinful not sinful. I'm not saying that at all. But you can show yourself some grace. God isn't done with you. 
He's working in you. And he's, he's going to continue to work in you. You're not going to have arrived until you're with Jesus. So show yourself some grace. Know that you're a tree planted by the stream that yields its fruit in its season. We talked about this a couple of months ago, but like, you know, if you go, if you go look at a tree, you can't watch it grow overnight. But go back and look at that tree in 10 years. Go back and look at it in 20 years. Like, just because you're maybe not seeing the kind of spiritual growth that you thought you would have seen right now, that doesn't mean God isn't working in you. Show yourself some grace. Know that that he who began this good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it. These are five things, and I could have picked 50 more things, okay? But I didn't have time to. These are who we are in Christ. Since this is who we are in Christ, what should we do? How should we live in light of the fact that we are justified, we're adopted into God's family, we're secure in God's hands, we've been liberated from our, our slavery to sin, and, and we aren't, he isn't done with us yet. Since that's who we are, what should we do? What are the things that we should do as the people of God? Six things real quickly. Number one is this. That since this is who we are, we should be an ambassador of Christ. That we represent the kingdom of God in a foreign land. That's what it means. He talks about being an ambassador. That we are representing our king. We are sojourners and exiles in this land. We should live as sojourners and exiles here. This world is not our home. We do not find a home here, there, or anywhere when it comes to this world. We should, we should always feel some angst in us. That, man, this is, I don't fit here. I don't fit there. Because we're sojourners and exiles in this world. So we live as ambassadors representing another kingdom. That is the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this. Therefore we are ambassadors of Christ. God making his appeal, (coughs) sorry, through us. It's God's appeal. God is one making the appeal. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, therefore, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For our sakes, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. We represent the kingdom of God in a foreign land. Number two, be an evangelist. Be an evangelist. That we go and proclaim the good news of God's love for the world that he has shown us in Jesus. If you think evangelist and you just think like Baptist revival pizza night on a Tuesday or something... Um, that's not what I'm talking about, even though praise God for those men that are faithful to do that. I was telling a funny story earlier about packing a pew, and I was at a church one time where we had an we had a evangelistic magician come, which was as weird as it sounds, okay? I'm not going to lie. It was, it was kind of like, huh. people trusted Jesus, okay? What, whatever. Um, when we talk about being an evangelist, that's not, we're not just talking about that. What we're saying is, as Followers of Jesus, we tell others about Jesus. We, we proclaim the good news that God has won the victory over our sin in Jesus Christ. You and I, every one of us, go and proclaim that good news. Romans chapter 10. Paul says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, some favorite verses, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Simple. For the, with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not, not ever be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. But the same Lord is Lord over all, bestowing his riches on everyone who calls on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a great promise that we can rest in. Everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no such thing as someone that wants to trust Jesus and can't trust Jesus. It's great news for us and everyone. Since that's true, Paul says, how then can they call on the one in whom they have not believed? They can't. These are rhetorical questions, right? How can they believe in him whom they have never heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful. On the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. This is a quotation from the Old Testament, right? The longer verse there says, How beautiful on the mountain are those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. And he says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So, verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. You and I need to be 
evangelists, going and telling people about the good news of Jesus, that God is, loves them and he's shown them that in his son, Jesus Christ. Two, be a disciple maker. That we help, one, as we follow Jesus, we help one another follow Jesus better. Now look, if, you're, if you've been around church very much and you hear the word being discipled, um, <clears throat> that means different things to different people. I think some people think being discipled means sitting in a coffee shop with an ESV study Bible and a moleskin reading a theology book, okay? And not that that's not a form of discipleship, but like if, if discipleship requires, you know, some, that's, not, that's not it, all right? That ain't it. All it means to disciple someone is to help them follow Jesus better. Like how, how do we help people follow Jesus better? We, we live our life with them. We do study the Bible with them. We teach them what it looks like to be a man or a woman of God. And I'm not, I'm not dogging that too much, I guess a little bit. But um, I just like, when, you, when that's what you think, if, if discipleship for you, mean, if it requires a notebook and sitting somewhere for hours and hours and hours, there's nothing wrong with that. But that is a really small view of what discipleship is. And that actually might just be learning. It might actually not be helping you follow Jesus better. If I could be honest with you, it might, in some regards, hurt. Because it ends up making people full of knowledge that puffs up. So let's be careful with that, okay? Let's be careful. Let's be care- Here's what we want to do here. When we think about making disciples. We want to come alongside one another and say, how can I help you follow Jesus better? How can you help me follow Jesus better? And one of the things I love about our church, and I think it's a healthy thing in our church, is that we, we're people, we're a church full of people that are at varying levels of spirituality. Some people have been following Jesus a long time. Some people are not following Jesus to come here. And our goal, no matter where you are, okay, no matter where you are, are we want to help you follow Jesus better. That's all we want to do. We think about making disciples. We're talking about helping one another follow Jesus better. Don't over-spiritualize that. Uh, don't complicate it. Look at your friend. Look at your roommate. Look at the, someone that asks you to, to, to disciple them. Someone says, hey, hey, Jeremy, will you disciple me? Yes, I will, okay? I want to get to know you. I want to know your life, and I want to figure out how I can help you follow Jesus better. That's what we mean when we say we're going to disciple one another. Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, given to Jesus, not to you. Go therefore and make disciples of who? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And behold, surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. As a reminder here, even though it doesn't read this way in the English, in the Greek, the command is not go. The command is make. Okay? The command is, really, it reads, as you go, make disciples. That is the command, to make disciples, to help people preach the gospel to them, evangelize them, and help them follow Jesus better. Next one, number next. Um, since this is who we are in Christ, right? This is, we're doing these things because of who we are in Christ. The next one is be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Help others find peace with God and help others find peace with one another. Do not stir dissension. Bring peace. We should be peacemakers in person and online and in our text messages, in our gathering of churches. How do we bring peace? How do we make peace? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, because they're like their father. That's what he's saying here. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they're like their dad. They'll be called the sons of God. Those that are peacemakers. Romans chapter 12. <laughs> I've been in Romans a lot today. This my life. Um, it says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 
Imagine if we lived like this. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. I love this verse. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. And, and I don't have time to do this because I'm already over, but um, I'm going to do it. Uh, I, think, I think Paul's saying it, it is true that it is not going to be possible to live peaceably with all people. Right? Like there are going to be some people in your life that it is not going to be possible to live peaceably with. A wise person will understand that. But he says, as, as much as it depends on you, you live peaceably with all people. You, you pursue peace. You pursue reconciliation. You pursue a right relationship. As much as it depends on you. There are some people that, look, I, I have people in my life that I, um, I don't have a relationship with anymore, okay? There was some hurt. There was some awkwardness. Uh, we decided to, to be peaceable, but we don't, we're not friends, okay? Like, I'm not, we're not going to eat burgers together. Just, I mean, it's okay. It's okay. But as much as it depends on you, try to live at peace with all people. Be peacemakers. Next one. If that one didn't hit you hard enough, be an advocate. <laughs> As we make peace, we, we are advocates for others. We give a voice to those who don't have a voice. For the good of the world, for the glory of God. We use our voice to advocate for those who don't have one. We use our standing to raise up those around us that don't have that standing. We leverage the blessings that we have for the good of others. We do that as followers of Jesus. James 1 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We advocate for widows and orphans. We advocate for the least of these. We use our voice and give it to them, right? We do this for the sake of the gospel. We do this for the good of the world and for the glory of God. Proverbs 31, not just about the ladies. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. You do that as the people of God. We do this because of what Christ has done. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, when the angels are with Him, and He sits on His glorious throne, and there before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and He will place the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. And the King will say to those on the right, Come, come. To me, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom of God prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was a naked, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we uh, see you a stranger and welcome you, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. When we use our ability, our voice, our resources to advocate for those others, we are doing it unto Christ. Okay? And I'm not talking, here, let me tell you what this ain't. I'm not talking about some social justice movement. I'm talking about the people of God representing the kingdom of God as we advocate for the least of these. There's nothing political about that. There's nothing political about caring for those that 
that need to be cared for. There's nothing political about giving voice to those whose voices are muted. That's, that's, not, that's, that's not that. That is representing Jesus, right? Like, that's what that is. That we, we advocate for the good of the world and the glory of God. That's what we're talking about when the Bible speaks of these things. And then lastly, okay, be a peacemaker, be an advocate, and finally be a reconciler. That we, we are reconcilers. To reconcile something means to bring something that was at odds back into harmony with one another. Things that were against each other or just at friction with one another, we bring those two sides, those two things, those two people back into harmony with one another. We want to see people brought back into harmony with God and people brought back into harmony with one another. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're done. From now on, he says, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, he's a new creature. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God. The salvation is from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, and then he gave us, you and me, this ministry of reconciliation. You have the ministry of reconciliation. I have the ministry of reconciliation. It's seeing men and women brought back into a right harmony with God and with one another. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself and not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. We, you and me, have that. Not, and again, man, we, 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 I feel like we've gotten off on this. Ministers of reconciliation is the opposite of ministers' d divisiveness. And it, it would seem like divisiveness has done, there's been more divisiveness in the church in the last several years than there has been reconciliation. Setting aside differences for the sake of the gospel. Being brought back into harmony because of Jesus. That you and I, we are... Not only are we responsible to be reconciled to one another and to God ourselves, you and I have been given the ministry of reconciliation, that we help others be brought back into right harmony with God and with others. He says, therefore, we just read this verse earlier about being an ambassador. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sakes, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What if, okay, what if we allowed these things to define us? That you and I pursued these things because of what Christ has done. Because I've been justified, because I've been adopted into God's family, because I've been forgiven of my sins, because I'm secure in God's hands, because he ain't done with me yet. Like, because those things are true, what if I saw myself as an ambassador, saw myself as someone that is supposed to tell others about Jesus, to help other people follow Jesus better? to pursue peace, to advocate for those who don't have a voice, to see people brought back into a right relationship with one another. What if that defines us, church? I pray it will, because that is who we are. That's who we are. Are we going to live in light of that? That's the question. And my prayer for you today is that you would hear that and you would see that, and together we would help each other do these things better because of what Christ has done for us. Would you join me as we pray together? God, we need your help today. Um, thank you for a chance to remind ourselves of who you are, one, and then who we are because of that. That we're not defined by all these other things. We're defined by Jesus. And since our identity is found in Christ and Christ alone, these are the things we should do. These are the kind of people we should be. Help us be those people. Help us to live in light of that together. And Lord, help us to respond to your word correctly this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, we're going to take communion here uh, in just a moment. Um, communion, again, is for followers of Jesus. So if you're not following Jesus, we'd ask you to not take communion. Instead, we would encourage you to trust in Jesus himself, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Um, if you are a follower of Jesus, we invite you to take communion with us. There are little cups out in the lobby. If you didn't grab one coming in, you got time to go get one as the band leads us in a song of preparation. 
I would encourage you to confess your sins, prepare your hearts, uh, and I'll come back and lead us to take communion here in just a moment. You might want to go ahead and pull those tabs because uh, they can be tricky if you're trying to do it quickly. Uh, but prepare your hearts, and we'll take communion together in just a moment. As a reminder, we eat this bread and drink this cup. 
to remind ourselves of what we're just talking about, that our identity is in Christ and Christ alone. I've been forgiven my sins and adopted into God's family, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. So we eat this bread and we drink this cup as a physical reminder of that spiritual reality. If you want to get the little wafer there, we remind ourselves what Paul told the church in Corinth. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We always want to celebrate that, church. Let's stand together. We'll sing a song of celebration as we close.
declare this together. again together church he's our firm foundation reminder thank you for being here today uh, a few things to tell you as you get ready to go about your Thanksgiving week happy Thanksgiving um, hope you get to spend some time with some people that you hadn't seen in a while uh, and enjoy that great I love Thanksgiving food and it's gonna be, uh, be a great week um, a few things to tell you though as always there's a communication card on the bottom of your bulletin there if I can if we can pray for you, you in any way or get you connected in any way you can fill that card out and put as much or as little information as you're comfortable with on there and put it in the baskets in the back of the room. Um, if you grabbed a, a tag last week from Miss Tolly uh, to buy Christmas gifts for kids at Matthews, be sure to bring that back by December the 12th, okay? Uh, make sure you get that back in here soon. Parents, got good news for you parents with children, okay? Uh, our Parents Night Out is coming back uh, in uh, on December the, the 3rd, okay? Um, it, yes, this would be great. Um, Amy Nichols' prayers have been answered. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, 6.30 to 9, our Advent, parents' night out. It's a Friday night. Parents, come drop your kids off. Uh, go Christmas shopping. Go home and watch a Hallmark movie. You do whatever you want to do, okay? Um, it'll be a lot of fun. We'll give your, your kids will get some good Advent stuff as well. So uh, be sure you come and join on that. Ladies, the next day, uh, Miss Tolly uh, and some ladies are hosting something called Brushes and Brunch, okay? Uh, from 9 to 11. Uh, both of these things, if you could sign up for them, that would be helpful. Um, I'm sure you can do that somewhere. I just don't know where, okay? I guess online. Uh, or you can put it on the communication card there. That would be, uh, be a good thing. Uh, again, thank you guys for being here. Sorry I went over. Um, I, I can't promise I won't do it again next time, but um, I, I might not. Uh, but, uh, but Hebrews chapter 13, let this send us out of here. It says this. 
Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may be able to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. I hope you have a great week.